Welcome back, everybody, to the Retrograde right here on Dead Jester Cinema. What is the Retrograde? Well, I go through an old movie, and then, when it's all said and done, I break that film down into four categories. Plot, characters, direction, and music. And I assign a letter grade to each of those categories, and then, at the very end, I take all those grades and combine them to come up with an overall cumulative grade for the entire film. And on this episode of The Retrograde, we're going to look at the 1995 sequel to Children of the Corn, Children of the Corn 3, Back in the Habit. No, wait, um, Children of the Corn 3, Dangerous Minds. No, that, that still is not right. Um, Children of the Corn 3, The Substitute. No, damn it, um, oh, pff, duh, Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest. The film opens up in where else? Gatlin, Nebraska. As drunky McDrunkerton chases his son Joshua into the cornfield with a scythe because I guess that's just what drunk hicks do. And it's here where we are introduced to Joshua's brother Eli, who tells him to scram before the grim drinker arrives. And when he does, Eli gets a little help from his friends and turns that alky into a scarecrow and has him watch over and protect his limited edition corn bible. It is worth noting that the violence and the gore have been ramped up in this sequel, and this opener is a brief taste of that. And it's relatively quick after that that Josh and Eli are adopted by the Porters, Amanda and her husband William, aka Discount Shooter McGavin, who bring the kids to live with them in their home which they had matte painted into downtown Chicago. But Eli could give a shit about their house as he's more interested by that vacant warehouse that's conveniently adjacent to their property. So later that night, Eli takes his suitcase full of magic corn over to the lot and starts planting his seeds of evil. evil. The next day it's Josh and Eli's first day at their new school and they are introduced to Father Frank, who immediately senses there's something weird about Eli, but he ignores his intuition and takes them to their classroom. But you know, being the new kid in school can suck, so Eli attempts to make friends by getting into a fight with class asshole T-Bone, whereas Joshua decides to make friends the stereotypical 90s way, playing basketball. And all those awesome slow-mo skills impress Malcolm and his sister Maria, and the three quickly become friends. But all this fun isn't sitting well with Eli, who stomps in like a jealous girlfriend and demands to Josh that he stop. For as cool as a villain as Eli is, it's moments like these that make him just look like a clingy little bitch. Which is weird because, you know, they're brothers, but... Anybody who has seen this movie knows exactly what I'm talking about. As days go by, Amanda starts getting increasingly suspicious as to what Eli is up to as she notices him going to and from the warehouse a lot. So she goes to investigate and finds he's been growing a secret stash of corn! <gasps> I mean seriously, there are worse things he could be growing back there. But nervous about the whole thing, Amanda brings it up to William, who immediately dismisses her as being paranoid, but then later apologizes and says he'll go cut it down the next day. As all this is happening, some ZZ Top looking hobo stumbles in and finds all that delicious corn and decides to have himself some snackers when, whoops! Well, that's one way to deal with the homeless problem. The next day, William goes to destroy Eli's work, but after getting a taste sample from Eli, he reconsiders and is like, hey, I can make some money off this shit. Later, during one of Father Frank's school sermons, Eli stands up and gets all preachy with his adults are evil shtick, and it appears to put all the kids under a mass hypnosis. And that night, one of the adoption agents tries to warn Amanda about something strange she found out about Eli. But before she can, Eli uses some of his magic powers again and... <laughs> Oh, oh boy. And let that be a lesson, kiddies. Smoking kills. Amanda, now pissed off at William's lack of acting, says fuck it and decides to cut down Eli's corn crops herself. But her happy pruning adventure doesn't end well as she is nearly consumed by the cornfield itself. She does, however, manage to escape, but when she runs back into the warehouse, she slips on the one pole in the middle of the room and then proceeds to fall 30 feet backward, spiking her head on an exposed water pipe. And that's it for Amanda, everybody. Let's all wave bye. Bye! Thanks for coming! And the next day, as Father Frank starts noticing disturbing behavioral changes in the school children, Josh is busy getting a baseball lesson from Malcolm's sister Maria, but Malcolm does not approve, and he stops that shit dead in its tracks. 
Later on, T-Bone, who is still holding a grudge from earlier in the movie, interrupts one of Eli's sermons from the Bad Music video set, and when he chases Eli into his teleportation cornfield, he gets caught and nom nom on by the head of that old ZZ Top hobo. And obviously scared shitless, T-Bone then agrees to join Eli if he lets him go. Now, I've heard of an ear of corn, but I had no clue that you can grow a head of corn. Oh, come on, really? I thought that one was good. Throughout the film, Father Frank is being tormented by nightmares of Eli, but this time they get a little too real. And while praying the next morning, Eli shows up to have a holy joust with the priest. Who the hell are you? Father. As if you didn't know. And if you're waiting for an answer to that, join the club, because it's never addressed again throughout the whole movie. Meanwhile, after getting some convenient plot development about Eli in the mail, Josh enlists the help of his friend Malcolm, and the two leave to seek out help from Father Frank, who is busy getting these hands from Eli. But in his dying moments, he tells them that the key to stopping Eli is destroying his Bible, so the two drive off to Gatlin to find it, as Eli is busy getting his adult killing business underway. Oh yeah, at some point, William strikes a deal to sell Eli's corn, but does anybody really care about that? No? Okay, we're just gonna move on then. Back in Gatlin, Josh discovers Eli's Bible, but also discovers his dad, who has been turned into Scarecrow, Scarecrow Man. Man! But he goes down pretty easy like the bale of straw he is. And before the boys can get away, the corn says, Not so fast, you owe me a new Scarecrow. And in a pretty sick display of effects, Malcolm is decapitated Sub-Zero style and becomes just that. I mean, shit. What a fucked up way to go out. Back at the closing ceremony, Eli kills William, who is just trying to celebrate his big corn deal, when Josh arrives, claiming he knows all about who he is and how to stop him, which he kind of just pulls out of his ass. Anyway, Eli is done f***ing around and starts chucking fireballs at his brother, demanding that he hand over that book. And in a last-ditch attempt to retrieve his Bible, Eli threatens to kill Maria. Josh then tosses him the Bible, but then sticks him with a sickle straight to the chest, freeing the kids from their hypnosis. And if you think all that was stupid, strap in. Thinking it's all over, the kids start to clear out, but the cornfield has one last surprise as... What in the f***? I'm at a loss. I'm at a real loss. Is that, is that he who walks behind the rose? Is that what he really looks like? What the f*** is that? Well, whatever the hell it is, it's super pissed and starts slaughtering all the kids and even tentacle rapes poor Charlize Theron. Maria attempts to take the monster down, but not so fast, and the monster grabs an obvious doll of Maria and chows down. But Josh jumps in to save the day as he chops a hole in the beast, freeing Maria from being digested and killing the monster itself. And the movie ends on a cliffhanger showing Eli's corn being shipped around the world, but it's a cliffhanger that goes nowhere in the next film, so who gives a shit? And holy hell, that was Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest. There's nothing else left to do except to throw this thing into the retrograder. The plot in this gets a C-. I really like the fact that this movie tried to do something different by taking it out of that rural, small town setting and taking it into the big city environment. It creates a very interesting juxtaposition between the rural horror you expect in Children of the Corn against a very different and urban backdrop. But in doing so, I also feel like this movie falls into the trap of that 1990s dangerous minds troubled inner city youth cliche that you saw in so many other films around the same time. And for me, it just kind of cheapens the experience. There's also some time frame confusion that centers around Eli in this because it's explained that he's not really the age he appears to be, as evidenced by him looking the exact same in newspaper clippings from the 60s. But the shit in Gatlin didn't start until around 1980 with Isaac, which was established in the first movie. It's a little confusing because we don't know, is this just a straight up continuity mistake? Is this intentional? So yeah, but we're gonna dive more into Eli here in a little bit. Once again, there is another weak subplot involving getting rich off of corn, which feels like a bad hangover from Children of the Corn 2. They do try and put a twist on it with Eli exploiting Will's greed in order to sow his seeds of adult destruction worldwide. But at the same time, I don't think that Children of the Corn needs to be pushed to a global level. It works best as its own isolated small-scale horror story. But ultimately, it's a plot point that is completely ignored in the subsequent sequels, so... 
It all just feels pretty meaningless and the whole thing is just dead on arrival. I'm giving the characters a C- as well. The two standout characters in this are Eli and Father Frank. And I would have liked to have seen Father Frank as the main protagonist, as I believe there's a lot more of an interesting dynamic between him and Eli in this sort of exorcist good versus evil way. The potential for something cool is there. But it's all for naught as he is just a side character, which I feel is a damn shame because I feel as a character he is really underutilized. But Josh is our main protagonist here, and he really doesn't do much. He kind of meanders around the frame for most of the movie, and he also comes off as being way too naive to everything going on around Eli. Until, of course, it's convenient for him not to. For a lead character, he's just very bland and not very interesting. In terms of the rest of the characters, there's not much really to say. The foster parents, William and Amanda, are pretty stock, and the other school kids are extremely cliche and stereotypical, and they don't really resonate or leave an impact. Which brings us full circle back to Eli, because for better or for worse, he is the one character in this movie that leaves an impact. Unlike Isaiah in the previous movie, Eli commands your attention every time he's on screen. Even when he's trying to be sweet and innocent and turning on that boyish charm, he still creeps you out. Yes, there are a few moments here and there where he hams it up a little bit, but it's Children of the Corn 3. I mean, I can let that slide. But what annoys me is that they set up this big revelation of his character and who he really is, but it never happens. They constantly tease you throughout this movie, making you think, is he a demon? Is he possessed? Is he the embodiment of he who walks behind the rose? Is he the corn monster? Is he all of those things? Or is he none of them? We never find out. It's never addressed. It's like the filmmakers just forgot about it. And it's loose ends with characters like that, that whether intentional or not, sometimes just drives me to drink. The direction gets a D plus. While it is just slightly better than Children of the Corn 2, it's still pretty poor. But that's not to say the whole thing was atrocious, there are some decent moments here and there, but it's just littered with weird angles, shitty blocking, and just bad dated techniques, even for the time. But like I said, it's not all bad, and I probably would have given this film a C- grade, but they had to go and do the one thing that annoys me the most, and that's reuse shots. I mean, for f**k's sake, how hard is that shot to duplicate, seriously? All it is is a plow shovel being dragged through a trench with some dirt thrown over it. A $50 trip to Home Depot and about three hours of production time, and bam, you got your shot. Again, no excuse other than just straight up laziness. The musical score in this movie gets a C+, which for the third film in a row is the highest mark that any of these movies have gotten, and I think that's starting to say a lot. Unlike the previous movie, the music in this one is pretty solid. It has an ominous overtone to it, and it has trace echoes back to the original soundtrack. My one and only real nitpick with the score is the fact that it sounds like the composer had a real hard-on for the song Carmina Burana, because it sounds like he tries to duplicate that sound and just repeat it throughout the entire score. But I mean, other than that, there's not much else to say. It's a score that isn't technically crazy or memorable, but it's decent enough. With those four grades combined, that brings the cumulative total up to a 72%, and I don't feel like it really needs to be rounded up or rounded down. So that means that the final grade for Children of the Corn 3 Urban Harvest is a C-. There's only so much you can do with Children of the Corn, and trying to extrapolate a 16-page short story into a film, much less a franchise, is damn near next to impossible. And I admire that this film really tried to do something a little different by changing the setting and the locations. And for what it's worth, overall, I think this is a step above Children of the Corn 2. But there is a reason this film went direct to video. It sucks. It doesn't suck so bad that it's unwatchable, it just feels very cheap and really rushed. It's obvious that by the end, the filmmakers didn't know where to go with it or what to do, but they shoved it out anyway. So does Children of the Corn 3 ultimately get my recommendation? No, not really. But if you are curious, then by all means, check it out. And that's it for this edition of the Retrograde. What did you guys think of Children of the Corn 3 if you have seen it? Did I grade it fairly? Do you think it should have been higher? Do you think it should have been lower? And where do you kind of put it in the grand scheme of Children of the Corn films? I think right now, it's probably second best, but it's a steep drop-off from the original.
But as always, like, comment, and subscribe, and adios, and GTFO!